Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast entitled Prime Chat, Better Insights, Better P-R-R-O-I. Today's conversation is brought to you by Prime Research, the Institute for Public Relations, and powered by OnStream Media. With Prime Chat, top corporate communications from some of the world's most prominent organizations share compelling experiences, guidelines, and insights promoting research and public relations. Prime Research, along with partner the Institute for Public Relations, supports a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews featuring the professionals, profession's top PR research thought leaders, presenters to date, including speakers from McDonald's, SAP, and KPMG. This latest installment features Allison Hugley, President, Measurement, and Analytics of Weber Shandwick. Allison will be interviewed by fellow IPR Commission member Prime CEO Mark Weiner, a chairman of the Arthur Page Society and author of books, essays, and features about PR research. To submit a question or comment at any time during the webcast, please click on the Ask a Question button on the bottom of your screen. Simply type your message in the box and click Submit. Alternatively, you could submit your question via Twitter using hashtag PrimeChat. All questions will be answered at the end of today's presentation. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to today's moderator, Mark Wiener. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thanks, everyone, for joining. It's my pleasure to introduce Allison Hughley today. Uh, Allison is president of Measurement and Analytics at Weber Shandwick, uh, in my opinion, a, a, a real illuminary in the field in that she's um, bringing to light provocative new approaches to uh, demonstrating and generating a positive return on public relations investment. She's a winner of many awards within the, press, uh, within the profession, but also uh, from outside the profession. So we're pleased to have you with us, Allison, and I, uh, I invite you to begin. Great. Thank you so much, Mark, for that uh, very generous um, introduction, and thanks to everyone who uh, made time to join this discussion today. Um, what I'm going to share um, on the call today is really a, a part of a journey that we've been on at Weber Shanwick to, to think about given all of the changing dynamics within the communications landscape and the wealth of data that is available across channels, how we started to think about the need to challenge ourselves and then hopefully help our clients think about more innovative ways to evaluate um, earned media. Um, one of the, the areas that I've observed you know, over the past few years is that PR is increasingly digital and dynamic. A lot of emphasis focused on, um, of course, traditional media relations, but also social media, digital conversations around content publishing. And there was so much emphasis has been given to how do we become more sophisticated in our analysis of, of content. And, and part of what we'll share again today is, is about our journey to think about how can we apply the same levels of rigor to earned content that we've seen um, begin to be embraced around social, around site, and around other channels that are becoming core to effective execution and audience uh, engagement under the, ban the broad banner and expanding banner uh, of public relations. One of the areas that, that we've really been focusing on has been this sort of evolving uh, data dynamic. So sort of taking a then-now approach, this idea that a few years ago there was a lot of focus on you know, social intelligence, and now there's emphasis on, on business intelligence. Um, some of you may have seen it, but there was a New York Times article uh, that came out today, actually, that uh, really highlighted the importance of not solely relying on social media data, for example, as an indicator uh, of things like purchase intent or even brand preference, that it really needed to be complemented with data that exists offline. So this whole idea of integrating data, not relying on data from a single channel, and really laddering up to business intelligence, we are seeing as being so much uh, more important to our clients and how we execute um, effectively across communication channels. A few years ago, auditing and focusing on listening platforms and how do you mine, again, social data, media intelligence, and now we're seeing more emphasis on really database development and management to be able to actually own the data that's being created to manipulate it in more creative ways and to leverage 
many um, market solutions for data feeds, but actually creating and, and having greater ownership over the data that we have access to or that we're creating on behalf of our clients. Monitoring to modeling, again, more advanced statistical methods being called upon and being critically important. Filters, more so than fire hoses. This increasing demand for marrying of the human and the machine and machine learning technology. And then finally, you know, reactive to proactive. So I could talk for a really long time around each of these points, but I want to be sensitive that we have limited time today. But the idea is just that there are so many currents of change that are impacting not only how public relations needs to be thinking about um, media and media intelligence and data aggregation and analysis, but also how our clients are also being challenged in more um, more interesting ways, more complex, more challenging ways to think about how they apply data uh, to their businesses and how can we as counselors be more effective partners. So these are the dynamics that are really guiding our thinking um, around how to advance um, data and analytics uh, for our agency and also for our clients. We're also seeing a lot of evolving business dynamics. Um, this article, I believe, came out uh, in the summer, but it was about a, a company called Upbeat that had gotten an infusion of um, you know, VC investment to create a data science-driven alternative to PR agencies. This idea that you know, be the human side of public relations is going to continue to be paramount you know, is really being challenged by the advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning and applying algorithms and data and data science to doing what for so long was, was very much viewed as a human um, area of expertise and something that cannot be easily co-opted. So suffice it to say, we're just watching all of these kind of, for now we'll call them pressures because there's still work to be done to consider them opportunities, but really pressures and dynamics that were forcing us and again, many of our clients to think differently about the role of data um, and also more advanced and sophisticated technologies in, in how we apply and think about how we get smarter around how we execute communications um, leveraging data. The disconnect, however, that, that we started to see was the idea that um, as much as there has been a lot of advance in terms of digital and machine learning, we still felt that, and I apologize for this, apologize for the skews on, on the screen, it should be impressions, AVEs, and clips, but what we were counting and what were really core foundational metrics to traditional earned media analysis really hadn't experienced a lot of innovation. In fact, the article that referenced the company I just discussed, Upbeat, really called out uh, public relations for being slow to, to innovate. And so what we saw was that there was an opportunity to begin to think about how we could do um, earned media analysis a bit differently. We also took to heart the idea that there's actually significant risk in not trying to bridge that gap between um, earned media analytics and a lot of the advances that are taking place in other spaces. Basically, and this is um, this is from an, an Annenberg study that came out earlier this year, but agency leaders saying that 50% plus of their revenue is, is still driven by earned media activity. So while we've seen all of these advances in technology and platforms for more sophisticated analysis, analysis of social data, of site data, of you know, really unpacking content publishing and using that for signals to become smarter and creating feed loops, the earned media side, as much as it's still core to the business, had not experienced um, the same level of advancement, and we saw that as being a significant risk. Even further, it's still expected that earned media will be a primary driver of revenue for most agencies, even for the next few years. Now, of course, after 2020, that's definitely expected to change, but in the near term, given how much of the revenue is, is attributed to traditional earned media uh, relations, it really did call out the need for for advancement. Sorry, there's a slight delay on the slide. There we go. <laughs> um, so really what we saw was a business imperative to bridge that gap. And, and in bridging that gap, we felt that the first thing that we had to focus on was, you know, how do we abandon measurements, that, measures that really no longer are suited for how information is shared and consumed today. And so one of the first areas that we wanted to challenge was this idea that we still have, um, you know, Many clients, it's core to the industry, relying on impressions as a primary source uh, of measurement and an indication of success. This idea of potential reach, this idea of creating opportunities to see, incredibly impactful and, and still foundational to a lot of measurement, but that's really no longer consistent with how content is consumed. So this idea of publication-level impressions data 
um, being used as a measure or indicator of success when really we read posts um, and pages, but not necessarily publications anymore. So much is consumed on mobile and social. So much is uh, unpacked where we're consuming articles as individual pieces of content really made us begin to think a bit differently around what is the opportunity, given all of the data available, to potentially um, uh, develop a new way of thinking about how we could evaluate that is not tied to publication, but is tied to specific pieces of content. Further uh, reinforcing this is that if you look at how people consume, you know, fewer and fewer, and this is really just looking at a trend over five years from 2012 to 2017, fewer audiences, you know, are consuming, you know, every page uh, in a newspaper or, or on a news site. And so the idea that we would still rely so heavily on impressions, which are publication level, again, this is just a reinforcing proof point that we needed to pursue a different way. Again, this idea that Overall, it was about 14% in 2012, down to 10. And even when you look at millennials, which you assume would be digital native, it was always around, um, you know, 5 or 6%. So it hasn't dropped off as significantly. But if you look at the more mature reader base, um, which grew up with traditional media, there's been a significant drop off in the numbers that are, again, consuming entire, uh, entire publications. So, again, so really, what we began to question is why were we still measuring at publication and outlet level when we should be measuring engagement with specific pieces um, of content, and, and how do we begin to get there? Another area uh, as part of our research where we looked a little bit deeper was the idea of, well, social tracking can be a proxy for, for whether or not people are engaging with, with news stories. So looking at um, news stories, social shares, for example. What we actually found was research that showed that you know, many shares uh, and URLs are silent, which means that they get shared having never been clicked on. So people are both sharing stories that they've never read, potentially with other people who will not read them either. And so the idea of how do we get to um, not necessarily all data is, is um, both right and wrong. I'll position it that way. But at the end of the day, how do we get to a less optimistic measure of the content that's being consumed and really try to pull out um, some of the data indicators that we have been relying on because they were available, but were not necessarily as close of a proxy as we needed to be able to demonstrate to our clients that we were having appreciable impact in terms of gating exposure. To crystallize that point, so I've gotten, you know, measurement is fabulous, which hopefully everyone on this call will agree with, but unless you're busy measuring, um, you know, measuring what's easy to measure as opposed to what's important is often what happens. That's often the abstraction, that's often the exhaust in the process that consumes a lot of our time and attention when, in fact, it's not actually the, the depth of indicator that's really going to help us move the business forward um, and, in this case, advance the communications work for our clients. So as I started, all of these kind of proof points and observations really laddered up to, you know, kind of a conundrum or challenge that really set us on a journey as an agency to try to find a better way to evaluate uh, communications, particularly media relations. What we thought was important was to first figure out um, and put a finer point on why we measure. So why does earned media relations matter? Is it just to, is that measurement just to, to prove, or is it also to provide a mechanism for gathering strategic analytics that give us direction, activation analytics that help inform how to execute better, and then also performance analytics that will speak to the value of the communications. And so with these three guiding pillars, if you will, we use that to really think through around what are the critical types of questions that we want to answer using media relations data, and also what is the role if we were to move away from measures um, like impressions, for example, or coverage counts that will really help us leverage earned media data to provide more strategic insight and intelligence um, to make us smarter about the work we do and shift away from, from just proving. One of the challenges that we had is that mining social data gave us a lot of uh, insight into what people um, were thinking based on their conversations, their posts, and their comments. With earned media, what we were missing was this idea of, of an audience insight and an audience intelligence. And that was something, again, that became a guiding kind of principle on this journey as we, we sought to pursue a better way. So we wanted to establish a criteria for news evaluation, article-level comparisons across news stories so that we could understand, for example, story breakthrough. We could understand which stories were actually resonating more with audiences generally. 
And so one of the first phases was to do some testing of our thinking to actually understand if we were to look at article-level data uh, for news stories, what type of level setting would we need to, to kind of go through to understand how that would compare with what the data that our clients were more accustomed to seeing, such as impressions data. And we found that, you know, across, um, you know, a series of news outlets that just posted um, data for two of them here, you would have, you know, two times to as much as 12 times difference in terms of the impressions volumes that were reported relative to the actual, you know, activity data or view data that was available for a given article. So this sort of provided that, that supporting point that there would need to be some level setting and we wanted to be informed about that as part of uh, developing, um, you know, a, a better way, as we like to call it, but also the idea of really understanding how we would need to have conversations with our clients to re-level set, but also what would the new sort of truth around the data tend to look like and what would a less optimistic view of actual engagement with content look like. So we, we engaged in a testing process. We also wanted to figure out and, and put some parameters around how will we then contextualize this data. And I mentioned earlier it's the idea of audience, but we also wanted to highlight intent, attention. And we felt that in the middle is where we would get to insight. So we wanted to um, complement our output level measures, so that would be our impressions and our coverage counts. We were not looking to abandon that. We were looking to be additive. And what could we add to that? We could add attention uh, metrics and indicators, so our news stories attracting readers and breaking through relative to other news and priority outlets and to what degree. And then also from an audience perspective, which audiences are actively engaging with earned media content and how does that vary across different story types as well as outlet types. And to, uh, to bring it all together, you know, understanding that, that no one gets anywhere alone, we had to engage a partner. And this is one of the areas that, that we, I spent a bit of time talking about over the past year, which is that really the opportunity um, with NPR is to kind of push past um, traditional partners. And it's all in the spirit of being complementary, but it's the idea of how do we explore opportunities to incorporate more data um, into the mix to be additive so that we're able to build out a more robust um, research mechanism. So in this case, we partnered with Hitwise, which um, is a Connexity company. Uh, they used to be part of uh, Experian and I think split off maybe a year or two ago. But because of that, they had a lot of infrastructure that was tracking not only um, click data across specific publications, which we work with them to, to develop a mechanism to target that functionality at article level data, but also a lot of insight into um, audiences and to be able to understand the audiences that were in fact consuming um, different types of articles. And then from there, it became a whole process of understanding how do we package that into real intelligence for our clients. So I'll share with you just a quote that um, was um, a statement from our, from our partner at Hitwise, uh, basically that you know they also believed in partnering with us on this bill. So, just to give a little additional context, we actually had a conversation with a number of different uh, digital data providers to see if this was something that could be brought to fruition. And Hitwise was the, the only one that sort of returned the call and worked with us for about uh, two years uh, to get to a capability that was actually um, usable, user-friendly, and got to levels of data um, that were really helpful. So part of this is, as everyone on the call thinks about their own data journey, um, there's a lot of discovery and relationship building on the partner side to really get to the right partner, um, especially if you're looking to build something out um, in a, new, uh, a newer space. So the culmination of the two-year journey um, with, with Hitwise, which I'll say has been an amazing uh, partner to Weber, um, with building out a platform, it's uh, housed in a Tableau interface, and basically we are getting um, access to their, their panel data. So they have a panel of about 8 million people in the U.S. and are tracking behaviors across 20 million websites. In the past, they, too, were tracking at sort of a site level and publisher level, but working with us and understanding the opportunity, they created mechanisms to be able to target specific article-level data. Currently, our... Um, Database is updated daily with seven-day rolling averages across um, about 100 top-tier news and business publications. And on a daily basis, we get a refresh of information about um, close to a million um, articles. The data that we're capturing around those articles is tied to demographics, so we can see the age and gender and geography of the audiences that are consuming uh, a particular 
article. So a New York Times article about, I think on the current cover, or, or Time Magazine, I think the current cover is the Jibo uh, robot. We can actually go in and see how many people um, actually read that particular um, piece of content um, and be able to tell them how does that compare with sort of the average reader base uh, for, Time, for Time Magazine or Time.com. Um, so that level of data and insight, and also to be able to drill down, as I mentioned earlier, HitWise uh, used to be part of experience, so they have um, consumer segment and lifestyle segment data. We can also look at it by certain uh, generational breaks, like boomers or millennials or young urban professionals, family forwards, those sorts of things, which is incredibly insightful in terms of understanding whether or not our client's content is actually resonating with the desired target audiences, which is something that um, until we develop this capability, we're actually not, not able to do. And so it's always great to come up with a new capability, but unless you're actually applying it um, to a client problem or challenge, um, you know, it could be solely left to reside in the that's very interesting bucket. And so one of the things that we did is we started to actually map out once we have the data, what are the different applications, and we've been working for about um, seven or eight months on actually applying these scenarios that I'll talk you through now against our, against our clients. So for campaigns, we're confirming that you know, news coverage is resonating with intended targets. So for one example, we have a, a client in the travel space, and they had you know, a launch event that was very exciting. It was marquee coverage um, featured in, in USA Today, but what we uncovered was that they were trying to target a new travelers or people who haven't traveled to certain destinations before what we were able to tell them with this data is that it was successful. The article and the coverage definitely broke through at a high level uh, among the USA Today base. But when we unpacked that a bit, we found that it didn't actually over-index with new travelers, but resonated more with the core, people that were already engaged. So in terms of it being successful and working with, you know, sort of a spillover audience was not as effective, and that was a valuable insight that we can now take back and use to inform um, the media relations work and the positioning and pitching uh, going forward. Understanding breakthrough relative to other news stories. So we, another client um, that was in the um, trucking automation space or transportation automation space had a great piece of marquee coverage in the New York Post. We were able to tell them that in a media week of seven days, that particular article ranked number 18 in terms of click activity. During that media week, the New York Post had about 18,000 articles that received click activity. So we were able to tell our client not just that they received coverage in a marquee publication um, and that it was well ranked highly, but we could also tell them that relative to other coverage that received activity during that time frame, their particular piece of coverage performed comfortably in the top 1% of articles that were engaged with. Then beyond that, we were able to further um, unpack the audiences that it tended to resonate with more or less, and, and the geographic skews, which can also help to inform you know, how that content can be re-socialized or retargeted across social channels or supported with additional uh, paid amplification. And then the, the other piece, which is more macro, is just insights to inform and update you know, um, media lists and pitch angles. So really getting an understanding of what are some of the stories that are tending to break through more in certain publications and just providing macro level insights that can help uh, our media relations teams really understand, you know, what are some um, trending topics or threads or, or uh, stories that are garnering a lot of media attention that we can use um, to create relevant hooks um, in terms of, of timely stories. One of the things that in the past we would use to do this would be, you know, a lot of social listening. But again, social listening still tends to reside on the extremes, people that are extremely passionate or who are you know, extremely displeased with something. But when you're trying to get at some kind of general interest areas and where people are committing their time and attention, we have found this to be a really effective complement to our social listening work in terms of providing insight around the news stories um, that are capturing people's attention, even if it's not converting into driving a lot of um, social conversation or social chatter. We've also found this platform to be really helpful in, in crisis situations. So again, it's this idea of being additive and having more fuel to inform our thinking and make better decisions. Combining this data um, with our social media monitoring, so if we're seeing a topic trending that's related to a crisis um, issue, better understanding you know, whether or not the attention is increasing or decreasing because we get data updated daily. So we can actually say, yesterday, this story was ranked uh, number 25, now it's ranked 15, now it's five, which means that 
more people are clicking on this content. Another interesting uh, piece about crisis situations is that oftentimes a crisis situation will result in redirecting attention back to a previous crisis or issue. This idea of sort of resurfacing or, or resurgence of interest in topics is another area that we've been able to apply this data towards, which is that because the data is collecting click activity regardless of when the article was actually published, we get insights into evergreen content, but also content where um, there's a resurgence of interest. So in certain cases, for example, with the, um, I can't think of a good example. So let's, let's say, for example, um, when there was the recent uh, data breach uh, for the credit uh, company, we were able to look back and see did that prompt any resurgence of other uh, of interest in other articles around uh, data breaches to add more context to the story and also to perhaps some insight into other potential um, clients who might be impacted by spillover interest, if you will, in, in data, breach, um, data breach incidents and events that could also adversely impact their brand. And then lastly, there's the audience piece, which is really the area that I'm most passionate about, which is it's finally being able to say, you know, who are the people that are gravitating towards specific types of, of news stories, and then linking those segments and audience profiles, you know, back to earned media performance. So we do, as I mentioned, in the, in the, with the three pillars, the strategic analytics, activation analytics, and performance analytics, oftentimes we do a lot of upfront work, um, or our clients do, around audience segments that they want to target. So now being able to go back and kind of close the loop and say that within the earned context, because that data is available um, for, it, for paid, for example, because you're executing the buy against targeted audiences. But for earned, we really didn't have a mechanism um, until we developed this capability to be able to say that we can now go back and say that you have a core target segment and we can tell you that you're over or under indexing with that, with that audience and these are the types of stories that are resonating with them and where can you find the connection points for the insights that will help either recraft some of the stories to make them more appealing going forward. In some instances, it's even thinking about different news outlets, given the types of stories that tend to rise to the top with different audiences, really suggesting that, of course, it's intuitive. People go to different publications for different things. Having the insight to be able to, again, bridge that knowledge gap and come with better informed and more strategic media relations um, strategies is, has been um, a tremendous value and has actually been the most exciting part of the work. So not even around measuring, but really the insights and the understanding to continue to, to optimize and, and better target in earned. Sorry, there's a slight delay. Okay, there we go. So the, the next section is just a bit of thought on kind of where do we go next with this. And so having applied um, you know, click activity, view activity data to the earned media space and the intelligence that we've been able to gather there really are focusing on thinking about, well, what does this mean from, from a conversion standpoint or a directing people to, to certain types of outlets uh, standpoint? So the idea of taking this sort of point in time data, the article data, and marrying it with the next level, which would be upstream uh, and downstream uh, clickstream data, we think has a huge opportunity. One, it gets us closer to where do people go, you know, post exposure to earned, which has also been kind of a, a, a shadow area uh, for intelligence in terms of understanding where people are directed to after consuming earned. Are they going to a site? Are they doing more discovery? So we want to be able to explore that. Ideally, currently, in full transparency, the technology is somewhat limited where you're getting, you know, the click before and then the click immediately after. What we're really excited about is the potential to eventually be able to look at that clickstream data at a, you know, seven-day, 14-day, 30-day um, interval where we can really see, you know, a few weeks to a month out from having been exposed, are we seeing some differences in, in behavior uh, compared to unexposed audience or baseline audiences. We've done a bit of work um, in this when we've had data available, so we're managing sort of a full-on campaign, and, and we've tended to view this as what we're calling sort of, um, we talk about media touch points as sort of the, the points where you can kind of intersect an audience. We think with focusing on quickstream data, there's a real opportunity to focus on things like flash points, which are where do we see kind of concentrated activity around specific um, articles, for example, or, or pieces of content 
that then are creating a higher level of, of direction or flow through to a particular endpoint, being it, be it a conversion, be it to a site, et cetera. And so we played with this a bit and we started experimenting it when we have integrated campaigns using um, a lot of paid media data and, and social data. But our hope is that once we have um, better uh, clickstream data available for earned, that we'll be able to add this to the mix and come up with an even more dynamic view of sort of what are the combinations of content that are most likely and the sequencing of that content that's most likely to have an impact um, on creating the desired behaviors that are going to matter most for our clients. Again, be it um, further discovery and an investigation around a product or be it conversion or donations, I think it's, it's a pretty open field, but the idea is better tabbing and better insight around the role that different media and, and um, media outlets play and media channels play in directing audiences towards that desired behaviors is hugely um, important and it is um, exciting to be able to now have earned media play a greater role in that intelligence mix. And Mark, I think that was my last slide. So thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you, Allison. Very compelling. Um, so beginning, um, as, as I remind attendees that they may post questions in the Q&A section of their screen, I have a few questions uh, already. Um, so when, when looking at an integrated framework, as you were uh, referencing towards the end, how do you see the levels of receptivity across those people who are responsible for paid and earned, shared and owned, to, yeah. to integrate in the, their data in the way that you're describing, especially because um, what, you're, what, what, I, what I hear is that um, impression figures are basically inflated but in um, but they are similarly inflated across other marketing and communication channels. So, to what degree do you um, are you finding others being receptive to this kind of uh, proper recognition diminution of viewership? So, so again, I I think it's additive. It's it's and both not either or at this point. I think. Until we've completely developed, you know, better ways of evaluating um, media and consistent measures across platform, which right now in questions happens to be one that is fairly consistent, it's a core input for a lot of um, modeling work um, across sector and, and market mix modeling, for example. But I think the, the challenge is that a lot of that work requires a lot of time. The complaints that we hear are that it's usually delivered at points that are um, not as meaningful because the work has already happened. By the time it's reported, you're into planning for your next campaign. So there are some challenges there with some of the mechanisms that have historically relied on um, impressions data in aggregate or, or in, as a collection. So I think there is definitely an appetite, and that's where we see this as additive, which is that you can still have your impressions data and you can support your modeling. It's a core input. We, we understand and, and, you know, for the time being, respect that. But this gives you something that's a little closer and a little narrower. This gives you more additive insight and intelligence. So it's not to compete with that. It's to complement it so that you're not going to know from your, your market mix modeling on a day-to-day -day basis what's working and what's not working. This allows you to kind of fill that gap with intelligence around, you know, how is your earned media relations working, for example, the same way that you have indicators and signals around how your individual pieces of social content or aspects of your website are, are performing so that you're optimizing all along the way so that when everything comes together for your modeling, you just have a stronger system. This is allowing us to have earned media, you know, benefit from having, you know, a bit more rigor and more refined data to optimize against and to inform strategy on a day-to-day -day, -day -day basis. In terms of the other part of the question around data integration, I think the challenge around integrating data has often relied on thinking about it as, as silos and thinking about it as competition, which is that I mean, this is the performance of my channel as compared to yours because we're competing for budget. The way that we tend to think about it is, is um, and it's, it's not entirely 
novel, but, but the way that we think about it is that there are contributory effects of different media channels. So understanding even within your models when your earned media works better, how does that contribute to perhaps not even your end business outcome, but how does it make your advertising more efficient? So the more we talk about the contributory effects versus competing outcomes or business impact, the more likelihood there is to get to a place where the data sharing becomes mutually beneficial versus a source of competition. Makes sense. So uh, it's a reminder and a way to reinforce the, um, the shared focus on elevating the enterprise rather than one's particular um, yeah. uh, contribution to, to business outcomes. Um, that's very helpful. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say quickly, the other way that we've used this particular data is that, you know, so much emphasis is now being placed on, you know, earned media needing to be amplified by paid across across social or doing other forms of sort of um, distrib paid distribution to make sure that the content is seen and visible. This allows us to understand, you know, which articles, for example, are already have some momentum behind them and interest so that those paid dollars will likely work a bit harder. Um, work a bit harder for the brand, and that also benefits, you know, the outcomes that the media buying agency um, or partner will report. Right. So depending on the situation, uh, paid or earned, shared or owned, may be a form of insurance across all channels. That if yeah. uh, if you discover that the uh, earned media amplifies, accelerates paid media, you can. Um, boost paid in a low-cost way through through traditional public relations. Yes, exactly. Got it. So I think this idea of it, again, very big on contributory effects, increasingly, I think, more so than ever before because of the blurring of lines, how news gets consumed in social channels, et cetera. It's just, it's, it's harder and harder to, to view data in a meaningful way in, in Isolation, and in fact, it's one of the biggest challenges we have if a client asks us to, you know, demonstrate your earned media impact on on sales, and we have to engage in that exercise in isolation. It's it's really impossible. So, um, how um, so? What you're describing feels evolutionary, but the implications are are big in the way that, uh, as you re referenced at the beginning that um, most PR uh, investment goes towards traditional media uh, relations. What, um, what do you think are some of the most um, revolutionary possibilities for the future? Uh, how far out do you see those revolutions taking place? And uh, in what way will it upset the conventional wisdom of public relations in the way that it's currently practiced? Um, you know, I do think there will, I don't want to say there will be a reckoning, but I think there will be a realization that, you know, not all content has equal value. And currently when we are reporting at impressions level, it's getting into the anything in a publication, you know, gets the same, gets the same mark, right? So it's like, if you're in the um, the A class, you know everyone gets an A automatically, regardless. And so I think that is um, you know that is unfair, and I think it brings to light that that we can be a bit more nuanced. We can put more rigor behind it, um, but it, it does require a conversation. It does require having um, you know where we're seeing the most success in, in full transparency is among clients who have embraced impressions for what they are and have kind of already started to move away from them. They also have a different view of the value of data, which is separate from reporting for a for proving necessarily, but they want data that really focuses on making them smarter, helping them do their jobs better. And you know, I and not all clients are there. There are some that just want you to prove you did what you said you were going to do and there we are. But there are others that, that view in a complex, increasingly complex media environment that actually the real value is that every piece of content that you put into the marketplace should provide a signal that then comes back 
you know, to the home base and makes everyone smarter about the work that they're doing. So I think that's a cultural shift um, mm-hmm. that needs to happen. In terms of where this can go, I think really with the clickstream data component, that gets really far into really potentially being able to address the conversion uh, questions and not just that you, you know, pass through um, a particular piece of content and then immediately, you know, went to a website because that's also not realistic, but being able to kind of build out the timelines and the customer journey so that we're better able to illustrate earned media drives people to take really this specific action, and not based on a survey or what people self-report, but really based on being able to track the, the, actual, be, the actual behaviors um, and being able to create just much more robust and comprehensive, um, you know, discovery journeys around products, around brands, around issues, um, I think is really exciting. So, again, for me, it's the audience piece and understanding more about the who and how do we direct people better across media channels to get to those desired outcomes. Understood. So, um, so to improve, uh, to, 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 by improving performance day to day, throughout the day, in, your, in the way you're describing, naturally leads to better results for those who apply this technique rigorously. That, that is <laughs> that is the hope <laughs> that, um, that that this is the um, kind of in between work that needs to happen to make sure that when you're doing the macro level, whether it be brand tracking or market mix modeling, that you've put all of the right fuel into mm-hmm. those systems with these sort of micro uh, insights and intelligence moments to be in a position to um, really see an appreciable change. Um, yeah. Well, at least that the likelihood of success would improve uh, by the, for those who think this way than for those who choose to ignore it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> why do you think earned media analytics has been slower to innovate, especially given, I mean, there's such a vested interest in uh, earned media for public relations investment decision makers now. Uh, why do you think it's been slower to evolve and innovate? Um, I think part of it is budget, to be honest. Um, you know, the, at the end of the day, if we look at where there have been, you know, more advances um, in the paid media space, media buying space, those have much larger budgets, so the resources that need to be carved out to do more advanced analytics, you know, are um, a fraction of the overall budget. I would still say that even for larger scale public relations activities, it's still not comparable from a budget standpoint to what you have in the paid space. So I think part of that is just the, the economic realities. Um, I think another side of it have, have been some of the cultural dynamics, um, you know, for better or worse within the industry, which is that, you know, I still oftentimes have, have meetings with clients, and I, I understand there are different points of view around data. There's quantitative data and there's qualitative data. And I think for a long time the qualitative side has kind of reigned supreme, which is that, you know, we have a halo um, piece of coverage and we can take that into the CEO and it can be framed and it can show that we, you know, we got this marquee placement, um, and that was enough. So I think that's another side of it, which is that um, there was just a culture that, that kind of accepted a different way of measurement that, that skewed more qualitative, and until you get to the clients demanding a change, oftentimes the innovation really follows the client. So even in our instance, where we had to go through multiple data partners to get to Hitwise that was able to work with us in this, on, on this um, developing this capability, it came about because there was someone who was aggressively demanding it, which in this case happened to be us. So I think part of it is the demand, um, the demand for better, and then having that demand be really directed. If you look at the criticisms of everything from the ability score to programmatic, it's really clients. Um, P&G is the, the company that most consistently comes to mind, but really kind of creating a mandate and setting a standard and requiring that the data partners and providers and their agencies do more and apply and apply more rigor um, to what was being delivered. And so I'm not saying that our – I know I say our method is perfect. We are trying to iterate and discover and introduce new thinking, but some of it comes from, you know, demanding that we, we try to do things a different way and being open to doing things a different way. 
I would also say that the other side of it is that, that the numbers are going to be different, and that requires a significant shift. Innovation, you know, if you look at, for example, the shocks to the system of the industry when, you know, viewability began to be pushed aggressively, what that meant to paid media inventory and, and challenging the quality of inventory, those are just realities that, you know, the, the we need to prepare for as an industry if we want to go, you know, deeper down this path towards better and more refined, I shouldn't say better, that's not fair, but just more refined measures because there's truth in the impressions data at a publication level. But there's also truth and I would argue more value in being able to look at specific pieces of news content and, and do that level of analysis from an insight, audience intelligence, and you know, media relations optimization standpoint. Got it. So when I think about what you're describing, coupled with the fact that audience attention has always been fragmented, right? So I watch TV and I'm looking at my phone and reading the news and playing a game. I'm doing all these things simultaneously. Um, this, uh, this the, the insights you're providing um, really have uh, potential for, for big, big impact, um, which I, I, and I think now, I don't mean to get into, go back to this competition thing, but I know that, um, uh, are you seeing advertisers, for example, using the same logic that, um, you know, that only certain people see the ad, for example? In my experience, media planning was more like um, buying gross rating points and <laughs> the assumption that everybody read everything, whereas in PR... I think we've, in general, in many cases, taken, or at least in some cases, taken a more conservative approach in at least um, looking at the opportunities to see mm -hmm. and comparing to probability to see, sort of mm -hmm. recognizing that not everybody reads every page. What you're right. describing uh, sort of works backwards. What did people read and work it backwards from there? So... Um, Anyway, big big impact in the future. Yeah. I think I think just to your point on advertising, what was really interesting to me is this past spring at the the ARF conference, there was a lot of discussion around advertising wanting to push past traditional demographics, for example. So I think all communications disciplines are challenging themselves and trying to solve for how do we get to a better view of the audiences that we're engaging um, that we're engaging with our content because that's really where um, where the value lies and I also think there's just increasing efficiency from the client side in terms of wanting to understand that their dollars whether it be invested in earned media or paid are being used efficiently and so this at least allows for um, you know the same way that our, our paid uh, brethren are, are challenging themselves to try to come up with more uh, refined ways of defining audiences beyond traditional demographics, it, it's similar to what we're trying to do here, which is that, you know, at the basic kind of prove our value level or efficiency level, we want to prove that those dollars are being directed in the, in the right ways to the right, to the right channels. And, and so I think whether it's earned or paid, those are challenges that, you know, all communicators are, are grappling with right now. And another challenge I see, uh, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, it's the notion that everybody seems to have a tool now, you know, now that they're so accessible, low cost, even free. Everybody's got a tool, which suggests to me everybody has access to data or, you know, certainly much more democratized than ever. Um, can you comment about on, on the gap between tools, data, and actionable insights? So, um, I hate to say this, but I, I am a firm believer that, that you get what you pay for. And so I think there are a lot of low-cost solutions, which unfortunately I think sometimes push towards data commoditization, um, which is risky because, um, you know, there, there's an abundance of data. The challenge really comes in, in how do you evaluate the quality of that data? Right, and, and what it's telling you. And I think that goes back to one of the points I raised earlier around initially everyone wanted the fire hose, but now people want filters and they want more refinement. I mean, even if you look at, for example, 
the reports around the levels of bot activity. For example, when you look at websites, something like 50% is like bot activity, 52%, something like that. Um, so this idea that you can get a lot of data around everything from social chatter to influencers to um, site traffic, unless you are really vetting your partners, and it's not to say that lower cost solutions aren't any good. I would just say put an added level of scrutiny in, in the review. You need to really bet that you're getting something that's quality and that you can base sound decisions on. And I think the probability that you're getting something that's really high quality diminishes the more low-cost solutions. The other piece about data is that the most low-cost solutions tend to be exclusively automated. And so that, as much as we have advances in, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you still have to train those systems. You still need a human element in there to make those systems work really effectively. Again, we have a great kind of digitally based capability now, but it took us two years of human, you know, thinking blood, sweat, and tears to kind of get there. And so the idea is that I think lower cost usually has less human, which probably means there's less um, thinking through and digesting and testing and vetting that goes into getting to something that's really good, especially if you're looking at platforms that are lower cost and you're using it for things like content analysis or sentiment analysis. You know, it's very hard for that to be high quality and sufficiently customized absent a human element, which still will, will come with more cost. Yeah, I think um, there's a shift in uh, what what people define as as good enough? So mm -hmm. I, I think, and I think part of the problem um, is the uh, are the outsized claims of many of these free, low cost platforms, which um, make a promise for measurement, evaluation, and insights where. Um, um, what, you know, what, why they cannot do that. You know, the tool, I think, is one part of the solution, but without the benefit of category expertise, you know, understanding public relations, understanding the category, whether it's, you know, automotive or consumer packaged goods or whatever, and without the ability to work with the data with a critical eye, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, it's just data. And so I've, I, I've um, I, I hear more and more about what people accept as being good enough. And I see, you know, while you're talking about raising standards dramatically, I think that the, the, there's also a movement based on convenience and low cost towards lowering standards to have, you know, to, 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 to uh, better be approximately right than totally in the dark. I get it. But... I, I agree, but I think the gaps are going to increase quite significantly between the good enough and the more kind of innovative solutions, and I think um, it may be good enough for now. I just think the challenge or the risk is that if you get – it's like a, a, getting comfortable with kind of a junk food diet. Right? It will give you the calories that you need to kind of stay alive, but – but it's about sort of also thinking through the quality of the existence, the health of, you think of your, your body as kind of an ecosystem or an engine, the health and how well it functions, how efficiently it operates, et cetera. So eventually, there, I, I think there will be a breakdown. Um, I, think, I think in the near term, it, it may be okay, but I, I don't think it's a good long-term strategy to, to um, play the short game, basically. Um, I do think investing in better tools, better solutions, because the challenge will be by the time that critical shift happens and the gap becomes sufficient, it will be too hard to make up the distance um, uh, in those so, that have been making investments in, in, in data and, and quality data and establishing partnerships. The other thing is that you, you may find yourself getting locked out of, like, the better partnerships <laughs> um, if you're not pursuing them aggressively now, if that makes sense. It does. So in addition to eating my vegetables, what other <laughs> advice do you have for our audience today about um, how to get started, how to evolve, how yeah, to take I, it further? I would say view it as, as a creative exercise, which I think may sound odd as a, as a data person, but I think, you know, um, 
look at your look at your ecosystem, look at your programs, look at your work, and just think about you know the I wish question. I, I wish I knew this about about my audiences or my channels or the performance of my work, and then experiment with finding um, different partners. I do think, and this is just pulling from my experience as we've sought to broaden our analytics talent mix, you know, hiring people from outside of industry has got a huge infusion of different, more innovative and creative thinking around what the data opportunities are. So I would challenge us to think, um, you know, it's an and both. So we, we have our core partners that have been core to the you know, media relations industry, highly respected partners like Mark, your company, Prime. That is amazing. But we should, as, as those that are demanding and looking for that data on the agency and client side, we should be looking for opportunities to, um, what is the, the end both? What is the innovative new partner that can be brought in as a complement to create something new that will take us to the next level of insight? So I do think part of this is a, is a desire to experiment more, to ask some unasked questions, and then have conversations with our data partners and really understand what is what is possible now or what should they be thinking about? Again, this came about because we wanted to answer a question, actually, which is how do we get article-level data, really basic, and we found a whole host of other use cases. But if you start with a question and a conversation and you bring that to your data partners, you may be surprised around, you know, what could be, what could be developed. But I think it has to start from, you know, the client, which in this instance would be agencies, and it would also be, um, you know, our, our clients um, that are in-house, you know, demanding some levels of innovation. I think the other advice would be we have to do all of this together because unless what is developed is commercially viable, it will not get broad adoption, so it will not be used as a standard, and it will be harder to get data partners to make investments to build out more new options. So I think that's something else we need to think about um, and challenge ourselves to do more going forward. Very good. Then, um, so I suppose we should all be open to these experiences. You never know when you seek a better mousetrap, you may end up with better cheese. So I encourage everybody um, to um, take heed. Uh, Allison's contact information, Twitter handle is on the last page of the presentation. I invite you to all look forward to our next Prime Chat. We have them once a month. And I will close by thanking you again, Allison. Great, great information, great insights. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much, Mark. Really appreciate the opportunity. And thanks, everyone, who carved out time to listen to our discussion. Excellent. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a wonderful day.